Hi everyone, Heather here with Astrology with Heather.com and I am back with another special video continuing our series on astrology and tarot. I'm back with the wonderful, brilliant tarot card reader, um, Raphael from Radiant Reality. He is seriously the best of the best and I'm super excited to be doing this series. We've both been learning so much and um, we're excited today to be talking about the magician. So welcome back, Raphael. Uh, thanks, Heather. It's uh, an absolutely, I'm so, so chuffed to be working with you. I think you really are a brilliant astrologer. I'm really, really grateful that you agreed to work with me as well, because your knowledge is in, immense and the way that you deliver it is so, uh, so grounded, like just ways that you can really use. So thank you for that. Um, much, much appreciated. So yeah, today we talk about the, uh, the links between the tarot and astrology when it comes to the magician card. Yeah, and so the magician, um, do you have your, your cards handy so we can... I do. <laughs> magician here. I've got a whole bunch of them as well. So I've got like tons of different magician cards <laughs> around me. Nice. I like that one with the, uh, it's like a sorcerer kind of vibe. Like it looks like a, like Dumbledore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 he's great. Um, and actually, I don't know if you can see this, but... If you look in the corners, some of the, the decks have the glyphs for the planets as well. Mm -hmm. So this glyph is obviously for Mercury. Um, I'm sure you are totally familiar with that one. Yeah. So yeah, to talk about the uh, association with the Magician card, uh, whenever you see the Magician card in terms of its planetary aspect or planetary correlation, you're actually looking at the planet Mercury. Um, and some of the things that you talk about when it comes to the Magician is uh, communication, uh, publication. This could be about public speak. I've seen this card represents uh, public speakers, coaches, writers, authors, anyone that works with a pen, anyone that works with uh, words um, tends to, to get this card as well. Um, so when we were, if you were like talking about those things, about communication, writing, words, like speech, the back and forth between those things, uh, what, would, what planet would come to mind? Yeah, absolutely. That would be Mercury. And so that makes perfect sense. And, you know, um, with the Magician card, one of the things that you mentioned, too, in your slides that you sent me for the course that you should definitely be teaching if you're not already teaching that, because I'm learning so much just reading through these slides. Um, I can only imagine how the course will be. But one of the things that you mentioned is that Mercury rules like merchants, right? And so the Magician card has that association as well. Um, and Mercury does have an association with merchants, commerce, uh, trade. It's not necessarily money, but it's the movement of money. And when you think of Mercury, you think about this fast moving planet that's constantly zipping through the sky. You think of Mercury, the winged messenger God, right? Who's delivering yes. messages at this like lightning speed. And so, um, yeah. So how is that correlated to the magician card? Yeah, love it. Um, again, so brilliant stuff that you bring up there as well. And um, in terms of the monetary aspect, it's kind of like the, the transactions, right? Like yeah. the back and forth between the money. Awesome. So your magician card, uh, when in terms of like the way that this shows up in its energy, uh, very much when you think about Gemini, it rules the hands, right? And doing things and the practicality of your skills. You look at his hands, he's got one pointing upward and one pointing down. Mm -hmm. And what that kind of talks about is taking information in or taking energy in and disseminating it in a different way or pouring it out in a way that kind of ties you in. Um, in terms of the of, there's other things here as well. So um, your gem, uh, in terms of Mercury, we talk about like the conscious mind and stuff. Mm -hmm. If you see there in the card, he's got his uh, his white wand, um, and we, we talked about in the full card, like the full had his like dark wood wand on the sort of on his on his back, um, mm -hmm. and so we talked about black being sort of almost like the potential, but it's something that you're kind of ignorant to or not necessarily conscious of. The fact that the magician has the white wand means that he's totally conscious of this energy. He's consciously aware of what he's connecting to and the information that he's using. Um, and when you think about sort of magicians and casting spells and stuff, what it's effectively you're communicating with the universe. You're taking that energy in and pouring it out for a specific or a desired result. Okay, so there's kind of like a Gemini energy there because Gemini is all about like picking up different types of information and almost like synergizing it and then redistributing it. 
That yeah, happens. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I love that you mentioned Gemini as well, because another thing that you see with this card as well is somebody that's got a lot of dexterity, somebody mm -hmm. that's really sort of quick witted and really fast minded, um, okay, which yeah. is really very <laughs> much when you think about Gemini's, right? Um, so the other thing as well, when you think of the, he's got the Mobius veil above his head. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you might know where we're going with this one. Yes, it represents the ups and downs, but it represents the union of things. Um, and when you think about, uh, so when you think about that kind of energy uh, or this conscious energy meeting the spiritual energy, um, the Mobius veil is, it's about tapping into the universal energy, but it's also about the ups and downs that we go through and what that taps you into is the understanding that not all of uh, not all of the presentations of the of the magician are of you know necessarily of the light or of the ease mm. so we get this kind of trickster energy that we mentioned last time and when you think of that what does it remind you of i mean that's totally like a gemini energy like that trickster duality like <laughs> can be one way in one situation, another way in another situation, and that can serve a purpose and that can be a really positive thing in certain circumstances. But, you know, when paired with other um, maybe planetary alignments in the astrology chart, it can also indicate somebody who's a little bit more sinister, who has that like diabolical energy to them <laughs> as well. Um, so yeah, I can totally, so this, is that how it works with the tarot too? Like if you have, if somebody gets the magician card, like you're, they're asking you a question, the magician shows up, do you look at the other cards to indicate, is this showing up in a way that's positive or a trickster sort of way? Yes, absolutely. I'm so glad that you asked that. That's such an awesome question. Um, <laughs> yeah. So just like in astrology, no planet, no aspect works alone right there's always other things that you tie into it so whenever you get a card if you were to pull the magician card you would absolutely look at what was surrounding it and depending on the way that you've laid out your spread you would look at the where his wand is pointing because that's where his conscious mind or his energy is and you'd be looking at his hand pointing downwards so if there was a card here and a card here oh. what you'd be looking at then is okay so how is this person using this energy here and how are they pouring it out so it could give you an idea of whether they're using that information or giving kind of like the truthful energy behind what they're putting out wow that's interesting i never would have like thought of that that's that's awesome <laughs> yeah just as a, so if whenever you've got time pull some cards out and like you could put the magician out as a as, as a significated sort of card mm -hmm. and then you could lay out cards for whatever your question was one above him and one below him so the card above would tell you what sort of energy is coming in or what they're looking at and then the card below would tell you how they're putting it out there or whether it's kind of information that can be trusted or you know whether it's good <laughs> quality information Oh, um, interesting. And so I love that you mentioned that. Oh, sorry. No, it's Please. okay. Keep going. No, yeah, I love that you mentioned the, the duality of Gemini as well, because, you know, so a lot of people kind of say that, like, oh, you know, they're really fickle and you never really know which one, of the, like, which side of them you're going to get. Um, and I think because the same as Mercury, it's, it's dual, isn't it? It can yes. be one way or another in a chart. Um, so how, how does that kind of work with the astrology? That's literally exactly what I was going to ask you. So <laughs> in <laughs> astrology, especially with the traditional planets, which is, you know, Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, uh, we have benefic and malefic influences, right? And so we have Venus and Jupiter as the benefic influences, and then we have Mars and Saturn as the malefic influences. They don't only bring bad things, but they tend to indicate sources of challenge, separation, delay when you're looking at malefics. Uh, the benefics can say yes to things, they open up opportunities, they bring things together. So you have those two different types of, um, of planetary energies. However, Mercury is neutral. And so you really do have to look at it as being like, okay, how is this associated with other planets? Where is it placed in the chart? What is it doing? Because it's not malefic. It's not benefic. It's literally just kind of in between. It can be whatever it needs to be. Um, and so I was wondering, do you have, are there cards that are like that? Are there benefic cards that are a little bit more leaning toward bringing, like showing, indicating positive energies versus malefic? And then you have kind of neutral cards yes absolutely and interestingly enough the magician card can go either way yeah. um, coming back to that sort of trickster energy um in fact we'll get back to that in a moment but yes benefic cards uh, your sun card 
absolutely. If you see the Ten of Cups, uh, beautiful, it just doesn't have, I mean, in some schools of thought, it has some sort of negative connotations, but I don't see it that way. I think there are some cards in the deck that are just light. Um, so yeah, your Ten of Cups, absolutely. Your Sun card, um, the Star card as well. These are all sort of like really bright energies. Um, cards that I would sort of bulk at <laughs> when they show up. <laughs> Definitely a seven of swords, okay. sometimes the eight of swords, but the, the eight of swords can sometimes be a bit more than that. Uh, ten of swords for sure. Uh, whenever you see that card and, and, you know, obvious ones like the tower and the devil, these are, t they tend to speak of more sort of negative connotations. They tend to speak of more uh, heavy or dense energies and things that are playing out that are the, the um, let's say, the darker shades of life. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes complete sense. And so the magician's kind of more malleable. Um, so that makes sense, especially because of like the significations of the magician. And like looking at that card too, it reminds me of just like an alchemist, like a true alchemist, like taking all these elements and, you know, sh shifting them and manipulating them in some way. Is that kind of an association as well? Absolutely. I'm so glad that you mentioned that as well. So if you see on his table, he's got the four, uh, the four elements there. So represented okay, by the yeah. pentacle, which would be earth. You've got the cup, which is water. You've got the wand, which is fire. And you've got the sword, which is air. And that's really, really interesting. So with this card, lots of times you might have heard as above, so below. That's like one of the huge preliminary, uh, not preliminary, the huge pillars of astrology, right? Is mm -hmm. what happens up there is kind of what happens down here. And the fact that you've got the four elements on the table is a kind of nod to that idea that what happens in the cosmos is going to be reflected down here. And then he's like pointing up and down at the same time too. That makes sense. And that's one of the seven hermetic principles in Hermes is Mercury. And then there you go. It's kind of like a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. It's so cool. Um, so yeah, speaking of the, the four objects, um, to go back to this trickster energy, um, when you think about Mercury, what's the one thing that it does that everybody knows of nowadays? Well, it goes retrograde. <laughs> it has some issues with communication and technology and misinterpreting things and misspeaking too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think you, you see a lot of that with the magician card because sometimes okay. this can be, you know, in terms of a trickster, this is somebody that's giving you information, but it might be the wrong information. Okay. Or it might be that the way that they're using that information is they're holding it over somebody or hiding certain information that could be really useful to somebody in a certain situation. Interesting. Yeah. And could it yeah. be, could it be somebody like taking the information and misconstruing it too? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, kind of twisting it. That's why I found it really interesting that you mentioned the, um, the way that Mercury can kind of jump sides, so to speak, or be whatever in any situation. When you think about Geminis, you know, if they're with this group, they're like this group. Yes. If they're with that group, they're like that group. I think that's why they get such a bad rap, you know, like, because they kind of, they just soak up whoever they're with. Yeah, and they kind of have this, um, well, there's a curiosity about them, right? That's like the Gemini energy. And when they get bored, sometimes Geminis, certain Geminis with certain energies tend to kind of toy with people. They'll like play with people, they'll play games, they'll mess around. Not even necessarily in a malicious way, just to see what would happen. Like I've seen this happen so many times where it's like, why did you do that? That was really weird. Um, but you know it wasn't malicious. They were just kind of like, that's their thing and they're a Gemini and that's just what they do. Like it's just them being them where like you wouldn't understand it otherwise. If you didn't understand that they were a Gemini, you would be like, this is like the weirdest thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's an interesting mix as well when you think about it as a sign and it's kind of like the magician as well. This is, can represent somebody that is super learned, somebody that's super smart, really qualified. Uh, one of the taglines for the magician is somebody that's at the height of their game or at the peak of what they do. Mm. It very often represents people that rise up through the ranks or end up hitting positions of authority or power. Um, and it's interesting, but they still have that kind of playful energy about them that's able to, you know, kind of um, flow with things as they might need to. Okay, so the mag magician would represent someone who is intelligent but doesn't maybe take themselves so seriously. 
yeah it could be that for sure um it can also be somebody you know on the on the other end of the spectrum it can be somebody that's almost like a little bit of a megalomaniac <laughs> <laughs> like a, a little bit of a, a control freak uh, and likes to be in control in all situations but then i don't know maybe as soon as they leave the office they're like a complete goofball interesting hmm <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so one of the other things that I wanted to ask you as well is in terms of um, a Mercury retrograde, how does it sort of present as an experience? Well, there are a lot of ways that it presents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so first off, this would depend on the person and where it's lining up in their chart and whether or not they have a natal Mercury retrograde. Because one of the things I found time and time again is if you are born during a Mercury retrograde, unless Mercury is retrograding and doing like it's making a bunch of hard aspects in your chart, Usually they tend to operate more effectively. They can make better decisions. They have a better uh, time signing contracts and agreements. As long as all parties are Mercury retrograde people, it'll usually <laughs> work out well. Or if you want to be the one benefiting and you're a Mercury retrograde person natally and you want the other person to lose, not that I'm indicating, like not that I'm advocating for that, but in certain circumstances. The beauty like, of astrology. <laughs> yeah, like if you're trying to benefit or like win a court battle or something, you know, and you're a Mercury retrograde, the other person isn't you might benefit from scheduling the court appointment or whatever during the Mercury retrograde. Um, but in general, it's a time when people tend to not communicate very effectively. They think they're saying one thing, but somebody else is taking it a different way. Mercury is actually stronger. So people, there's a lot more mercurial energy out in the ethers because Mercury is like three times closer to the earth. So the energy of Mercury is so strong that that's why all of these mercurial things tend to take precedence, like all of these technological and communication issues, short distance travel, issues involving vehicles, all of these little mishaps, plans, right? It's mercury rules are plans that we make and that, you know, usually we have to shift. They have to be malleable because that's a mercurial energy. You know, the best laid plans or whatever, I, I don't remember yeah. that saying, but like they don't, they don't usually work out. You can't always plan every single thing. And so that mercurial energy has to do with being more malleable when it comes to your plans. And so sometimes we have these plans laid out and mercury retrograde comes along and it completely destroys all those plans and usually it's for a reason though it's like once you go back and have to and you have to reschedule redo reevaluate this you realize there were some issues with these plans to begin with that if you hadn't gone back and you hadn't like reevaluated these things then you would probably not be very well off into the future and so these are the types of things that can come up during the Mercury retrograde, but Mercury is kind of screaming at us because it's so close to the earth. And so our brains are going to be thinking much more quickly. We're going to be moving through our reality much more quickly. So we're going to be more prone to mistakes, more prone to accidents because of that strong mercurial energy, not just because of the retrograde. Um, and it's, it's also a more internalized time where we have to think things through a little bit more before we make a decision, before we move forward, which is a natal Mercury retrograde thing too. Like people with natal mercury retrogrades, they have to in internalize uh, something before they either give a response or make a decision a little bit more so than other people. If they're asked to make a decision on the spot on demand for most mercury retrograde people, that's probably not going to be the right decision. So um, when you're, when mercury's in retrograde in the sky, it's kind of a similar thing. So it's like, don't just jump to a decision when a mercury's in retrograde, right? Think it, rethink it, make sure it's a good plan. Yeah, um, wow. That's so, see, this is your awesome <laughs> so knowledge there. Like, that's it's amazing. Yeah, you know, and, and it's interesting because is Mercury is your conscious thought, right? It's your conscious yes. mind. Yeah, so when it goes retrograde, I kind of see that as like you almost like you do kind of sink into yourself a little bit to kind of get your mind around things. It's interesting that you mentioned the um, the technology thing when I used to work in an office. Whenever Mercury went retrograde, we would have a problem with our phones um, and they had engineers, all kinds of people come in and to, to have a look at them, they could never find the problem. Mercury would go retrograde and it would start again. And my boss was like, I don't know what's going on. Mercury went 
much great. <laughs> yeah, and I've definitely found, I think Mercury definitely rules computers and the actual technology um, that we use to communicate. Like there's different significations for different things, but yeah, and that's the same thing. When I first started learning astrology, I was working in an office and the very first Mercury retrograde after I started like getting into this kind of stuff, um, my computer in my office, they had to replace it like three different times within this three week period during the Mercury <laughs> and finally they got it right when mercury would direct and i was like oh my god this is real <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's what i love like you can literally see it sort of working in people's like in your everyday life as well as as well as people's lives yeah um, so this card also represents people that specialize this is uh, people that take information and apply it practically to really great of um, to great effect and it tends to show up when you see people that are aspiring to something that they're having to or have already worked really hard towards um, and very often you'll see it's really interesting that you mentioned the going forward thing uh, when you see the magician card representing representing a person they are not really the sort of person that likes to backtrack they're very unapologetic this is someone that's kind of all speed ahead <laughs> And when they don't, and when they do have to sort of apologize or step back, it's kind of very uncomfortable. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So the other thing as well, in terms of your, uh, this card. So if you can see there, he's got there's, uh, all the flowers down the bottom. This yeah. is about what grows out of your efforts. It's about taking this cosmic sort of energy, this uh, mind-based focus and pouring it into something real so that you see a tangible result and that's kind of how I see the, uh, the you know when you use your skills when you use your knowledge and your information it mm -hmm. tends to bring you sort of results and I love that um, association because with Mercury, I always um, explain Mercury in my courses as being more like practical knowledge that you can utilize for something versus Jupiter, which is like higher knowledge, it's wisdom, it's having this sense of perspective or this like philosophy on life. But if you can't use it practically, it's just a philosophy, right? And so Mercury, if you have a good Mercury-Jupiter connection, you can have these big picture sort of ideals, you can have these bigger philosophies, this higher wisdom, and you can translate it into something that's workable and usable but if maybe you don't have that type of connection then it's just you know a philosophy is a philosophy but it's not really actionable so i like that that description of mercury because mercury is knowledge that you can you can actually do something with it's like practical skill sets yeah awesome i love that um I, another question if you don't mind yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome so in terms of um mercury how does it so we've talked about skills and practical application but how does it correlate to schooling well mercury would be like grade school and um you know things like that so it'd be it's, like grade school and learning skill sets, like a kind of how I just described that are practical and that are smaller, like trades and things like that. Um, so if you were looking at maybe predicting somebody going back and getting some additional education on a bigger scale, you'd be looking more at ninth house, Jupiter stuff. If you're looking at somebody going back to school in, a, in their adult years uh, for something practical, like maybe taking a small marketing course or just taking a little course here and there, learning a new language, that's also Mercury. Mercury rules language. And so so, um, and you know, words are spells, right? There's the magician. Yeah, there is, <laughs> Those would be mercurial knowledge, but um, it's always something practical that you can use and it's smaller and shorter and more straight to the point as opposed to the J Jupiter types of uh, learning, which are going to be broad and, and higher. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. It, and it really is as well. I think that's one of the things that I've always marveled about Gemini people. They can, tend to have this mix of being really sort of happy-go-lucky bubbly. And then you speak to them about something and they've got like lots of knowledge and facts about things. Well, they tend to be um, jack of all trades, but master of none, right? They tend to know a little bit about a lot of different topics. So they can sound like they know a lot. So they, they want to be able to speak on any topic in any given situation and pull that knowledge. And, um, but they're not as good at going in depth into something. And so um, what Gemini tends to be really good at is taking different pieces of information, like piecemeal, and synergizing it into something that's more complete, but it's, it's not in depth on one topic. I don't know if that applies to the magician because it sounds like the magician is like mastery over something. 
Yeah, absolutely. He's more, it, and it's interesting that you draw that parallel though, because with the magician, he knows what he knows. Mm. But that kind of is the, the blessing and the curse, because if you take him outside of that mastery, there's not really much knowledge of how to move in a different direction. So he's really good at taking what he knows and running with it and, you know, running with the ball and hitting the touchdown. But if you said to him, well, you've got to take a different route, there'd be kind of like a, no, no, we can only go this way. Okay, that's interesting. See, so these tarot cards, they kind of have these correspondences, but they're different. Like, it's not yeah. just like Mercury is the magician. Like, there are a lot of nuances there. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think this is one of the reasons I love astrology, but I struggle with it because there's so much. Like, with the tarot, you can go through various different meanings. What is it on a practical level? Or uh, what is it in a terms of a spiritual level? Or how does this show up in, you know, my life or my work or my career? With astrology, there's, like, so many different layers of it. You can talk about all of that, but then you've got how it interacts with everything else as well. Yeah, I mean, well, with tarot, everything you just said is very layered as well. <laughs> like, that, I get caught up in the exact same way. I'm like, how do I know what means what? And these cards are all laying out here interacting with each other how do i piece this together um and then each card has so many layers of symbolism and information in it that it i mean to me it, it gets a little overwhelming and i want to be right like i want to know for sure if this is <laughs> what it means and i feel like it's a little bit more subjective um which you know being a virgo that's a little hard for me <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I've seen because you're Mercury ruled as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah. that's the, the Mercury part of the magician, right? Where it's like focused on one type of um, skill set, one type of information, wanting to be right about that one thing. Because that's more of a Virgo thing for sure. <laughs> and Virgo yeah, is also that. ruled by Mercury. Yeah, absolutely. The interesting thing is the um, the association for uh, Mercury in terms of its Virgo aspect is the hermit. Yeah. And it's all about wisdom, you know, is very, very exacting and we'll do it sort of right the way through. You know, if we're going to go in, we're going to go in and we're going to do it properly and, and check everything out so that we <laughs> understand and know. <laughs> very, very Virgo. Um, your, yeah, your magician card it is, I mean, it's got so many different sort of layers of symbolism here. But if you see as well in the yellow background, that's that idea of the conscious thought, things that happen in the forefront of things or out in the light of day, so to speak. This is very much about what is in front of you, what you can see, what you can apply to, what you can touch, uh, what you can take in and use immediately. Okay, yeah, and that makes sense too with that more Gemini association because it's kind of like, a little bit of an impatience, like wanting instant gratification. Like I want to learn this and use it now. Um, yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And then yeah. on the opposite end of the magician, um, that's the world, right? So that's the opposite card. So yeah, because it's your. I mean, your full card is all things and no things. But yes, right on the opposite side, you would have the world card. Um, on top of that, if you look at its so its numerological aspect is the number one. Uh, if you were to simplify the number on the, the Wheel of Fortune, that's the number 10. So you take just the one and whatever it is that you're sowing or starting. So in terms of its, its sort of forward momentum, mm. the magician is also a very masculine drive. So Mercury in an air sign, Gemini is masculine, right? Gemini, yeah, Gemini is masculine, it's an air sign. So it has that kind of very, almost like forward projecting sort of motion, very, um, very masculine kind of energy. Mm -hmm. And its focus is on uh, that kind of linear way of doing things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it kind of, because it's the, what was, what's known as like the prima mobile. So it's like that initiatory force where something gets going. It doesn't really have too much sort of ideas about darting back and forth. It's just kind of heading towards what it wants to head towards. So it's great that you said about the impatience as well. Um, because it is that sort of directive force, it's very much about the, um, I've got this written down here as well, it's like a, a projectile sort of energy. Mm -hmm. So it's always heading towards something to, to kind of get from point A to point B. And in terms of your uh, Wheel of Fortune, this is where things come to fruition. It's where you see things start to, so this would be like the start. 
and then the wheel of fortune would be where it sort of culminates where you start to see what your actions or what your sort of forward momentum have started to create okay and so with the magician card being mercury and thinking about it being like masculine air that type of thing um so one of the kind of kind of drawbacks of that energy would potentially be like not following only incorporating the mental energy right this is like mental projection or like projection of ideas as opposed to looking at like your intuition your gut instincts um more of that receptive energy right so does the does the world or what was it the the wheel of fortune or the world? okay yeah the wheel of fortune um is that more of that like receptive energy how does that kind of counterbalance that Okay, so you're, yeah, and I mean, that's a really interesting way to put it because, and it's funny that you mentioned the planets earlier. The Wheel of Fortune has a very Jupiterian energy. Oh, so there you go, been, yeah. Right, yeah, so it's <laughs> where it's heading towards. So you have the idea and then you see it kind of come into fruition on a, on a larger or a grander scale. The Wheel of Fortune definitely is about more of an intuitive look at things. Now, um, interestingly enough when you see the wheel of fortune it's about synchronicity things that tend to kind of happen around what you've kind of what you've put out is okay. what you're going to get back on a more magnified um and you know more grounded sort of scale okay so could it be with the magician that you're not really sure what the end result is going to be you're just putting something out there yeah 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 absolutely and it's is interesting because obviously it's it's a starting card mm -hmm. it really is a card of beginnings of and it can be all of that new okay. things fresh fresh starts whereas in difference to say like the full card is just new things new matter and it can be almost anything the magician card kind of says i've got an idea of where i'm going and that's what i'm heading to doesn't really take into account <laughs> all the things that you could encounter on the way, right? That's interesting. Wow, I'm learning so many things. <laughs> um, so in terms of Mercury, like how does it, um, what I wanted to ask you here is this question, was the, what's the best way to use a Mercury transit? And I know none of them sort of work alone, but it, what would you kind of suggest in that respect? Um, well, if you're, I mean, Mercury transits are short, so you got a very short window of time to utilize them. So you have to kind of look at that. So using it for things that are going to be quick and that are going to get very uh, quick results, that's going to be one of the best ways to use a Mercury transit. Even if you're looking at making plans for the long term, um, it's not going to be for like the super long term, or it could be just refining plans that have already been set in motion. That could be a good way to use the Mercury transits. But really, um, you know, it opens up your ability to see things from an analytical perspective and to like think about things more logically in the area of the chart that it's transiting. So you, you start to think about things um, differently. Like maybe you have an area of your chart where you have a lot of like Piscean energy and Neptunian energy and Mercury comes in and it helps you to gain a different sense of perspective in, in the sense that you're thinking about things more logically in that area where normally maybe you'd be like blinded to that and you'd be kind of like wearing rose colored glasses and not necessarily um, taking into account what's real, what's rational. And so that could be a good way to utilize that, but it's kind of a short thing. Or, you know, if there's a certain um, uh, area of your chart that's being impacted that represents certain people, that's a good time to communicate with those people because that communication would probably be more productive, more effective. Um, you would understand each other better, assuming there's not something else going on, like a Mercury retrograde during that time. Um, that would be a good way to utilize that energy too. So like Mercury transiting your seventh house is a good time to have important communications with your partner. It's also a, a good time for negotiations of all kinds because you'll be much more clear. You'll communicate more effectively negotiating with other people because the seventh house is the house of contracts and negotiations, one-on-one -on -one interactions. And so you have to, you do have to look at where it is, but anything mercurial would be a good thing to do, but you just have to take into account that it's going to be short lived. So it's, it's not necessarily something that you're doing like a bigger, like if you wanted to start an educational pursuit, maybe Mercury would be a good time to think about it, but it's not necessarily a sticking it out type of energy. Yeah. Um, if that makes sense, you'd want something more long-term for that. 
Awesome, awesome. Okay, so on the opposite end of the spectrum, how would you how would you say? Because obviously everyone knows nowadays about Mercury retrogrades, and it's it's really cool that astrology is finding the mainstream in that way, right? That people are sort of aware of this stuff. Because it's funny, like even people that you wouldn't necessarily like, they're not necessarily into astrology, but they're like, oh no, I'll watch out for that because it's a Mercury retrograde, and you're like okay that's kind of cool that you know that <laughs> um how would you use a mercury retrograde transit what what would be a good use of that energy if you didn't have it natally um i mean a good use of that energy <laughs> is kind of just to, to take a step back a little bit and to not rush things and not push forward with things so much um if you're somebody that's normally like go 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 moving 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 ahead like i need to do this that and the other thing you know it's a good time to kind of take a step back and reflect it's a time to revisit old types of um like old educational pursuits so this is a good time to like review old coursework review old books old notes on things that you've learned in the past and reintegrate that knowledge thinking about those rewords like reintegration revisiting if you're um somebody who writes you could re-edit something or repurpose this is something that i love to teach uh, my business like my clients who have businesses or who do like blogging, marketing, those types of things, like taking old content and repurposing it during the Mercury retrograde is such a productive use of that energy because you'll find all these really great nuggets and you can take it and use it in a different way. Like these are the types of things that you can think about doing because Mercury is also marketing. Right. And so that's something that affects a lot of people, especially people who have small businesses who are working over the internet. Um, and so it's kind of like all these things don't work very well if you're starting them new. So don't start a new marketing plan, but revisit an old one or re revisit some old content. Um, and so it's really, it's a time to kind of go back and take stock of what you already have and do something with that as opposed to initiating something new, because there's so much there that you might've missed because you've been rushing through life this whole time. And you can take that and, and repurpose it. And I think that's the biggest thing to do during Mercury Retrograde. Awesome. That's, that's brilliant. It makes total sense as well. It really, really does. Thank you so much um, for all of your knowledge. Like I'm consistently blown away like with how much you know. And it just seems to literally come so naturally to you. It's, it's, that's the Virgo Mercury, I'm guessing. Yeah, well, thank you. I feel the same way about you. You like have all of this really incredible knowledge around the tarot, but you use it practically, like in a way that as a Virgo, I appreciate. <laughs> it's like, I can actually do stuff with this. You know, it, it's not vague. It's like practical. It's like the magician. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. awesome uh heather it's been an absolute pleasure so what our next card our next association is going to be the high priestess and the moon um which i'm really excited about because she's steeped in sort of mystery and she's a kind of an in, oh a quick question as well so the high priestess very very different to the magician mm -hmm. and when you think about the um the signs of the zodiac do you, do you find that as well like that each sign is very very different i once heard that they're kind of like each sign is a response to the one that came before it mm -hmm. does that sort of ring true yeah absolutely it's like i i like to describe it as like each sign sort of balances the excesses of the sign before it and so when when you talk about like gemini right that is an energy where it's overly mental it's overly focused on you know the mental plane the logical rational that type of thing and then you go into cancer which is very intuitive very flowy very emotionally and feelings oriented and more more subjective and so that's um completely it, it it balances that excess of the over sort of mental stimulation of that gemini energy um and then i think the next car we're talking about has that association with the moon and with that cancerian energy so it makes perfect sense <laughs> awesome that leads us on to the next one thank you so much i really look forward to it so again um yeah, please, if you haven't already, subscribe to Heather's channel because she's brilliant. Uh, stick around for more content. And your course, what's the course that you're doing at the moment or is it a webinar? Oh, I actually, I mean, I have a lot of courses, but I have a foundational astrology uh, video course that I have. Um, I have... 
I'm doing um, a webinar this weekend, actually, with um, one of my friends and my former teacher, Robert Phoenix, where we're going to be getting into the astrology of what's going on right now and into the future um, with everything that's going on with all the craziness and all that. So that's kind of what I'm preparing for right now. But um, this is actually going to be on my channel. So what are you doing? Let's talk about that. <laughs> well, well, yes, it is. I totally forgot. What am I doing at the moment? I am gearing up to create the next uh, next section of numerology videos. So I've just finished the um, personal year videos. I'm thinking I'm going to do the the karmic so, uh, the karmic numbers um, and see how that kind of turns out for people. Oh, awesome! Yeah, those are really popular. So I'm sure everyone's excited to dive into that. <laughs> Awesome. Listen, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Guys, take care and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone.